And today on Bole, the podcast, we have Andrew Barber, historian extraordinaire. Andrew, welcome to our podcast. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. Very good to be here. Andrew, Run it over to you. Um, before I move into your books and, and your history uh, um, and what you've done in respect of history, a bit of your background, Andrew. Um, you were a British diplomat, right? So could you just tell us where were you stationed around the world? Yeah, I was, well, I was 21 years, 21 years uh, British diplomat. I left straight from university at the age of 23, joined the what was called the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, FCO as we called it. And then I had a series of postings. Now, they're not the Genevas or the New Yorks or the Washingtons. I was sent um, originally to Pakistan, then to Indonesia, Jakarta, then to uh, Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, and finally, with various stints in London in between, um, to the British High Commission in Kuala Lumpur. So I loved it, actually. I had a great, great career. I uh, went to a lot of interesting places. Um, but not the sort of the glamorous diplomatic capitals like Vienna and Paris, but uh, in many ways, places I thought were much more colorful and interesting. So, You were, you, you, you were not uh, stationed in those glamour spots, but um, I detect some sort of trend that you were stationed in trouble spots. So on that <laughs> note, could I ask you the next question, which is what was your exact role as a British diplomat? I was there to calm down problems as we saw them, to maintain peace and sort of uh, help. No, I was obviously a British diplomat, so my job as a junior, you know, I was a bit less junior as I got older. Um, but um, these were parts of the world, I think, where the British, particularly sort of Pakistan, um, to a degree Ethiopia, um, Malaysia maybe even, where the British felt they had some influence, some role to play still. Uh, maybe that was a little bit of a legacy of, you know, former glory days. Um, so anyway, I was involved uh, very much on the security side of things. Um, often there were sort of conflicts at play. So I got involved with um, trying to trying to sort of support diplomatically some of these uh, areas. Some areas I can't talk about, frankly. Um, yeah, I can imagine. Being the nature imagine. of the beast. Now you're probably getting yeah. that message. <laughs> yeah. So moving on to... to to history. Now, you've written uh, quite a few books of history. Um, I think they're all Malaysian or mostly Malaysian. Mm. Um, we have uh, Penang at War, KL at War, Colonial Penang. So tell us how a diplomat starts to enter the uh, area of history and starts to write and research history. How did that happen? It was not a great plan. I mean, I had done, I read history at Cambridge University. So that's my background. I did an undergraduate degree and then got an MA in history. So I sort of had that way back in my sort of academic past. Um, and then while I, it was here in Malaysia, um, I you know, took an interest in Malaysia and the history of the place. Um, and when I went to try and find books to read about the history of Malaysia, um, they seem, there don't seem to be too many of them. I didn't find them particularly interesting or colorful. Um, and then a friend of mine who was publishing a monthly magazine for expatriates asked me if I'd be willing to write a monthly article with illustrations, with um, images um, for his readership, which was a very non-professional, um, just a, a regular readership um, about aspects of Malaysian history. So I focused on some little episodes, quirky stories, um, that um, seemed to find an audience. I got quite a lot of people writing back, asking me for feedback and comment. Um, so I started writing a series of these monthly articles for the Expert Magazine. And then after doing that for about two years, um, I suddenly realized that actually I had the, probably had about 20 different stories, small. And I thought if I packaged them in a small paperback book with lots of pictures and images and made it lively and accessible, um, that people might be interested in. And indeed, it proved the case. Malaysian Moment called. Um, we're now just about to print our third edition. Um, it's very much designed for the non, non-expert, the, the person who's just sort of generally interested in life, not particularly having a background here. And um, so that sort of led me into history. And it also led me into what I call accessible history, where it's not dry and sort of dull and 
rather ponderous and full of itself. Um, hopefully, where people can sort of get in and sort of enjoy some of the drama of the past. So that's what led me into it, and I enjoyed it. Um, so I guess that led from a collection of essays into a um, into a series of books as I got more and more into it. Now, uh, moving on, moving on. Um, having read your books, uh, whilst you say that they they are actually catered for uh, a reader that maybe perhaps not too sophisticated, is is fun. It's not history book for his, uh, historians, so to speak. Mm. But you actually have done quite extensive research, and and tell us about how you source your material. That's 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 actually quite an interesting aspect of your your books. Yeah. Source well, your materials. As- that's, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I try to make it accessible history, easy history, easy to read, but I don't think that means that you have to dumb down the history. And so, as you'll see in my book, there's a lot of footnotes, endnotes, where I will say where I've sourced some of the common idea from. And that may be to Archive Nagara, might be to the Singapore National Library, National Archives, it could be to the UK National Archives, Australia, it could be to um, digital newspapers. It's a whole range of subject uh, areas you can turn to. Um, and indeed, you know, the glories of the modern world is that I can sit here in my apartment in KL at any time of the day or night, and I can access an extraordinary range of material. Um, certainly, get on a huge round of cataloging. What have these um, archives got? Um, particularly the newspapers, digital art newspapers. So it's become much more user-friendly. You can now do a lot of online searches for names that you couldn't do in the past. So I can pick up a Straits Times from 1941, 1942, and search, digitally search for individual names, which you could never have done 20 years ago. So in many ways, the um, the past has become more and more accessible because of the digital revolution. Um, So, yeah, and what I did find, my first book that I wrote about was, um, well, there were two, one called Malaya, The Making of the nation and another one about East India Company in Penang. And I used just secondary material for that, secondary being already published articles or books. And there were sort of compilations, and I brought them together. Um, but then when I started doing Penang at War, uh, Kuala Lumpur at War and others, I started getting, I uh, guess as I got more confident, getting into the archives themselves and actually looking, which is a far more intense um, process, um, digging deep into the archives and finding material and then trying to weave that material into a narrative. And that is a much more demanding process. Um, but also it's much more satisfying. You do have some, you know, for a rather geeky sort of way, you do get your triumph. You'll come across a document or a report that really opens up a subject, that shows new light on it, that gives you some more depth. And you sort of layer up the understanding and the history. Um and there are some, I mean, there's some disappointments as well, where, you know, files that, because if they're going to be great, we've got very little in them. But um, so it's a sort of process, and it's a bit like a treasure hunt, really. Um, you get onto the story, you go off on little tangents, you get sub stories and sub stories of sub stories. You always got to bring it back to the main theme. Um, but I think you do, in so doing, um, help bring some of the richness of the past and some of the complexity. Um, of the past into the narrative that you're trying to tell. So I do recommend that once people say there is no cost to it, um, Arkham Nagara here in KL is free. All these digital archives are free. Um, you can read any number of newspapers. Australia has a thing called Trove. Um, the Singapore National Archives, National Library has a very good digital collection of old art and old newspapers. Um, so a lot of it is there and available to people that just like to sort of wander through the past, pick up the newspaper of the you know the sort of eighth or ninth of December 1941 as the Japanese invaded, and see what the Mail or the Straits Times was reporting that day. It takes you straight back. Now, just a bit more about your experience as as a historian. Um, we understand that you were guest lecturer on a ship, on a liner. Tell us about that. Well, there's a famous um, called Cunard. They have the Queen Elizabeth, Queen Mary, the Queen Victoria. Wonderful 
wonderful seagoing cruise ships. And um, so they invited me a number of years ago, could I go along and talk? Because what happens when you're at sea, um, when they're in ports, everybody gets off and looks around. They come to Port Clan and everybody jumps on buses and goes and has a look at Kuala Lumpur and so forth. But when they're at sea, some of these boats have up to 5,000 guests. Uh, there's so nothing much to do, right? There's not, well, you've got to keep them entertained. You know, yeah. they come here, there's eating and you know, plenty of food and they can lie by the beach. But actually, people like to be entertained. And um, one of the things that Cunard are proud of is their, what they call their um, enrich lecture series. And they get a series of lectures. And they always try to make sure we have a different sort of lecture. So I would go on as the historian, regional guy for Southeast Asia. At the same time, you might find that somebody who's been an explorer, who's, you know, conquered Everest or whatever, or other people come in with all sorts of different. Um, so it's usually a really interesting range of folk who give these talks, usually a three, maybe four lecturers on a sort of one week cruise. Um, and the greater, uh, my wife loves it. You know, you get to travel to nice. It's a places. nice holiday. Too. Yeah, it's a good little gig. And, um, Sadly, of course, because of the pandemic, those days have come to a, a halt as these ships were amongst the first to get hit. But um, I'm sure the days will come back, and uh, it's a nice time. Also, it gives me a chance to do some writing, because when you're not lecturing, there are no real distractions. So it's a good time to um, get into a little bubble, that sort of a bubble, and um, do a bit of writing. So that was a privilege. Mm. Sorry, can I can I just ask one question? Um, uh, I mean, you've, you've spoken of the researching side, and then you've you know, just touched on the writing side. What's the the, the part that you enjoy uh, more? Well, they both really go together, to be honest, Gopal. I really enjoy writing. The process of writing I find um, endlessly challenging. Um, and I love to go back over texts and revise them and try to often simplify them, reduce them down, make them more direct, make them more pertinent. So it's a, and you never, achieve your goal there's always you can always improve on a text document um the other one is if you do have a um perhaps a, some material some narrative that isn't very clear either you haven't worked on it properly you haven't improved the drafting or quite often the case you don't really understand the history that there's sort of uncertainty there so there's sort of two go together um two go, and i love layering up and i'll come back and i'll have a period and then i find a new piece of material on some earlier work i like going back and trying to layer that into the text um a lot of i think history is involved in that making judgment calls insinuating material um, sometimes having to completely revise what you've said or indeed you may hear later today to revise and rewrite whole chapters in the light of new information um so um, the two go together and they both have their, their strengths. But I guess writing would be the um, thing that I find most um, enjoyable. Now, coming back to your books, um, like, like we know that you've written an array of books, but one book is slightly off the beaten path, so to speak. One book stands out because it is about one particular individual. Uh, your book was published in 2016 and it's titled Doris van, van der Stratton, right? Could you just perhaps give us, firstly, a general idea of who Doris was? And then, thereafter, why the special interest in writing a specific book, partic particularly on one individual? Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, uh, Doris van der Stratton is a married name. Um, yeah, it's become, a, I wouldn't say an obsession, but it's become something that's um, sort of lived with me and continues to, to be part of my life as I try and find out more and more about her. And we're just about to produce a second revised edition of the book. Um, perhaps one way to get into that, those questions, is to give a little bit of background. And it thinks back to what Gopal asked me earlier. How do you get into this? And um, I was writing a book in about, 2008, 2009, called Kuala Lumpur at War, 1939, which is when the Second World War started in Europe to 1945. And um, this book was really a history about the experience of war on the city. There wasn't all that much fighting in and around Kuala Lumpur. It really wasn't a sort of a, a war story about campaigning and battles. It was much more of a story about what happened to Kuala Lumpur. Um, British were defeated and thrown out, and the Japanese 
took over, and then again at the end when the British returned. So it's more about the um, impact of war on that community, that society. And um, I was getting into the book and uh, looking to lots of different sources on it. And one night I was, I thought, I'll just see what the Australian National Archive have on Kuala Lumpur. There may just be something there, you never know. So I got their online um, catalogue up, um, and I think I put in Kuala Lumpur and put in some dates, probably 1942 to 1945, 46. And a document came up, um, the murder of Australian national D. Heath. Um, and in this case, it wasn't a digitalized document, so I had to ask the Australians to send me a copy of that um, document. Now, luckily, it was just a single file. It wasn't all 40, 50 pages. It was a single document. And it related to a report the Australian had. This is immediately after the war, 1940, late 45, when the Australians had sent to join a British team in Kuala Lumpur um, who were investigating Japanese war crimes in the city um, during the war. And the Australians had um, seconded this fellow, a fellow called Henderson, to join the British um, investigative team. And he was told by a lady in Kuala Lumpur that she knew of the case of an Australian national. It's quite a short document, but it has a lot of it in. She was an Australian national. She was married to a local, prominent local Eurasian family, the Van der Straat. Um, so actually, this lady used her, her earlier family name of Heath, that she had been maltreated by the Kempatai and had fallen to her death, and that also she had been the mistress, the concubine of the Japanese military of Kuala Lumpur. So there, in this very short document from the Australians, I thought, wow, this is interesting. An Australian national in or around about 1943, so a year or so after the Japanese occupation, she was the mistress of the Japanese commander and had been mistreated and had fallen to her death from the Kempatai headquarters in the uh, Lee Rubber Building in the center of Kuala Lumpur. So that obviously piqued my interest. And then I began to go to other archives. I looked after the war at a series of crime, uh, trials that took place. And lo and behold, I discovered that um, this lady, Doris van der Straten's interrogator, was on trial, went on trial. And I was able to read the newspaper articles about that trial. So that gave a lot of information. Then I also discovered in British archives and other places in Archiv Nagara, other testimony um, around her life and her, um, her experience. So I built it up and then I was able to add to my book, Kuala Lumpur at War, um, about four or five pages on her experience, Doris's experience, um, which is still valid. It's very much a sort of short, shortened version of her story. Um, but a number of years later, when I'd finished with Kuala Lumpur at War, and I'd done one or two other things, I kept on thinking of this particular case, and I thought, actually, if we can find more material, um, it probably warrants a small book in its own right, because there are a lot of interesting themes um, that come into her story. Um, so I came back to it at a later stage um, and produced a small book. That would have been um, the one you mentioned. So that, in sort of a, in a nutshell, was the background to my interest in Doris and Destran. What we have is, um, I mean, the story by itself is very interesting, and I'm going to go through the story with you. But how much of a scandal would it have been to have a white Caucasian woman as a mistress of a Japanese commander? And that's as good as treason, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you can imagine in the terror that accompanied the Japanese occupation of Kuala Lumpur, the Sukchin, people may know about that, the, um, the vicious campaign of terror that accompanied shortly after their arrival. Many families were victims of the um, Japanese occupation, which was very brutal. Um, and there you have this white woman living in a large, comfortable bungalow in the middle of Kuala Lumpur with servants, um, well-fed when other people were struggling to feed. Um, as the mistress of the hated Japanese commander, you can imagine the, um, the anger, um, the bitterness that people would show towards her. Equally, as well, I think we'll come on to see later, with the it's a time and an ability to take a less passionate view, 
it was also possible to see Doris van der Straten herself as a victim. Um, that she survived, we'll come on to the story later. She, she had her own issues and, um, perhaps it's understandable that she saw succor and, um, some calm and support through this, through this fellow called Colonel Coda. Um, but even her own husband's family, the van der Straten family, um, lost about eight, maybe nine members of their family directly as a consequence of the Japanese occupation. Many of them were killed and um, died in boats trying to flee Singapore. Um, families, young kids, three-year-olds, babies in arms were in boats that were sunk, um, trying to flee the last days of um, Singapore before the Japanese occupied. Um, one of the brothers, or brothers-in-law, um, went off on the notorious um, Thai Burma Railway as a, as a POW worker. He survived, but he was never the same again. Um, so you see all this, and I think it broke the family, and they never really knew how to handle this whole issue. They were ashamed, traumatized. It was beyond complicated for them. And I think you know we can sympathize with Doris now, but I think we should also sympathize with the family. Um, it was an invidious position for all. Um, but and that's one, I think, one of the complexities of the story sorry. that it's so yeah. interesting. Sorry. Not to give too much away now, but mm. um, her, she thought her husband was dead when he was alive at that time, wasn't it? That's absolutely correct. And the husband thought she was dead when she was alive. They both survived. There was a massacre. The husband was working in a tin mine, a British-owned tin mine, in southern Thailand, very close to the border with Malaya. And as the Japanese came marching through in um, the 8th, 9th, 10th of um, December 1941, um, the first British nationals they came across pretty much were this community of tin miners um, and planters. Um, and they had suspicions about this community. They thought that inside this community there were some British spies, some operatives were hidden, and they had good reason to believe that. In fact, that was the case. Um, but perhaps they didn't know the individual intelligence and um, special force operatives by name. But they then brought everybody into a bungalow at a place called um, Kampong To. In, uh, Sorry, Andrew, can I, can I just stop, stop you there, Andrew? We're mm -hmm. going slightly ahead. All ah, right, okay. So what, yeah. I, what, what I want to do is reel you back a bit sure. and perhaps start at the beginning. Um, who is Doris? Where is she from? And, and so before she comes to Malaysia, and yeah. that's where the Malaysian chapter starts, Yeah. Uh, give us a sort of a rough background about that first. So um, Doris came from, um, she was born in Dhaka in India. Um, her mother divorced, took her as a young child to England, um, and they lived there for some years. And then the mother with a new husband, with a local Keith, goes to Adelaide in Australia. And Doris joins the mother um, just after the First World War. Fascinatingly, we discovered that the address she gives in London was a thing called the Salvation Army Home for Destitute Women. So she came from the poorest of the poor, east end of London, this terrible house for women who were either walking the streets or in terrible destitution. But she joins her mother, fortunately, comes out to Adelaide, and she in turn marries. She has two children of her own. But unfortunately, that marriage also um, ends in tears, ends in a divorce. And Doris is um, a single woman again. Her new uh, ex-husband, in fact, takes her two daughters with him, leaving Doris on her own in Adelaide. But then, wonderfully, she meets somebody who I think is almost a polar opposite of her in character and nature, a fellow called Vil Philip van der Straat. Now, Philip was a mining engineer. He was studying at the Institute of Mineral Mineralogy um, in Adelaide. He was a mining engineer. And he was a very... He was a wonderful man in many ways. Everybody speaks well of him. He was a passionate opera lover. He was a tennis player. He loved the crossword. He was a very calm, generous sort of spirited fellow. And he met this rather feisty, angry, difficult woman, um, Doris. But for whatever reasons, they fell in love. And he then takes her back in about 1936, 37 to Malaya to meet his family, this 
big Selenese family based in Kuala Lumpur. And he then goes up to, um, with Doris, to uh, southern Thailand, where he's an engineer in this Pinyok and Kampong To um, tin mining operation. And they live there for two, maybe three years. We're not quite certain of when they arrived. Um, and I think that was a happy period in Doris's life. She had a very unhappy life. But I like to believe that was a good point. Mm. So newly remarried Doris um, goes to Malaya and to initially Kuala Lumpur, but then up to southern Thailand with her um, mining engineer husband, um, Philip, Philip van der Straten. And they settle in this community in southern Thailand um, based around, mostly around the tin mine, but also some um, rubber planting there. And there they settle in. And this is the community. Um, it's right on the, the border with Malaya, but also it's very close to the beaches on the eastern side of Thailand, Siam and Malaya, which is where when on the 8th of um, December 1941, the Japanese invasion force landed. This huge armada landed on the beaches of southern Thailand and marched quickly inland with very little resistance from the British. And the first community of British um, that they came across was in fact this mining community. And um, the Japanese were suspicious of them um, because they thought in this community there were a number of British spies and agents who had been infiltrated prior to the war, um, sabotage experts, um, and they had good reason to be suspicious because this, in fact, was the case. And within that community, there were about six, maybe eight operatives, not Philip van der Straten, um, who were there, trained by the British, for what they called denial operations, sabotage. So one of the first things the Japanese did, and it suggests their intelligence was pretty good, was to bring together all this community, including wives and children, into a Malay-style wooden bungalow, where one of those on pillars. They brought everybody in, and at night they attacked it. They surrounded the bungalow. They lobbed in grenades. They attacked them below with machine guns, and then they went inside in the dark, bayoneting and machine shooting um, as they went through. Um, and in this darkness, a number of them managed to escape um, into the night and into the nearby jungle, trying to evade the Japanese. And Doris managed to escape. Um, with another engineer, and they made their way into the jungle. But she was told as they went, somebody else told her that her husband, Philip, had been in fact killed. Equally, Philip bailed out of a window. He had been shot and injured. Um, but the next day, he escaped and hid in the nearby community. And he was also told that Doris had died. So the both of them ended up going in separate directions after this massacre, both believing that the other party had indeed been killed. So it must have been an extraordinary down moment, you can imagine, and things don't get much worse than this. But for Doris, this then led her on an extraordinary episode. She wasn't trained, don't forget. She wasn't a special operations trained operative. She was just a housewife. But she was with somebody, a fellow called um, Edward Peters, who was indeed a uh, special operations man. And they headed into the deep jungle of Malaya, fleeing the Japanese hiding with the Orang Asli, spending five months in the jungle, eating berries and losing them. I mean, they were a terrible state when they emerged the far side. Um, disease, beriberi, malaria, fever, you name it. Um, but eventually they dropped down the mountainside and found some support and succor from a Chinese um, smallholder who himself had sort of retreated from the, the main, the, the plains into the jungle to hide from the Japanese. And he looked after them for about a month. Um, but eventually they heard that, in fact, the British had surrendered some months previously, that the war was over, and the Japanese were in charge. And there was clearly going to be no... They couldn't survive in the jungle very much longer. They'd lost a huge amount of weight. Um, one report has Doris doing this great trek of hers without shoes. Um, so it's an extraordinary story. But they did eventually present themselves to a rather surprised, I would imagine, Japanese military outpost. And they were then taken nearby to Taiping Prison, which had been commandeered by the Japanese to hold POWs and civilian internment. Yeah, well, Chapman makes this great statement, the jungle is neutral. That's his, the title of the book. 
what he says in the book is absolutely true, is that um, it doesn't help you, it doesn't hurt you. What does is your state of mind. That perfectly good soldiers get absolutely freaked out by the, by the night, by the sound of animals, by the fear of it. And that those that survive are not necessarily the fittest, or the strongest, or the youngest. They're the ones with the tenacity and the mental power to um, survive. And I think this is very much the case because, in fact, Doris and Peters lasted longer in the jungle than pretty much anybody else. Um, five and a bit months, very, I mean, hardly any regular soldiers. Spencer Chapman did, but he was a very different character. He was trained. So apart from Spencer Chapman, pretty much lasted longer than anybody else. And of course, they had this extraordinary pre-story where she thought her husband had died. She must have been absolutely wrong. So I think between them, there was some electricity. There was something between the two of them. Um, Edward Peters and Doris van der Straten somehow supported each other, and they did survive. Um, in a mess. Well, we shouldn't underestimate. But why, the why, why the surrender then? Why, Andrew? Why the surrender uh, uh, to the Japanese and and which ended up in imprisonment in Taiping? Why not carry on hiding or? or well, they could have done. The one way. of the yeah, one of the explanations given was that the Japanese were giving quite big rewards to anybody who gave up information about hiding POWs. Mostly, they went in the jungle; they were hidden. So. So the worry was, and one day their Japanese protector went away and didn't come back. And this rather freaked them out. And of course, they were putting the Chinese guy at considerable risk as well. If he had been found, he would have yeah. been killed. So we don't really know. But I think it was a logical thing. This was in about May 1942. Don't forget the British had surrendered, you know, and they were in a very bad way physically. They needed medical help. Um, so I think it was a rational logical thing to do and um and this is sort of what happened once they got into type prison and um, the japanese looked up them perfectly well they weren't maltreated in any sense and they were able to get some medical help and some food um she was the one woman there were about five six hundred pow's and male civilian internees in this prison and she was the one woman there. um but they gave her they gave her medical treatment and she was able to start putting a back weight on but i think it's and how was she treated in prison? I mean, well, yeah. relatively, not, I mean, I mean, well, I think relatively well. I mean, I think at this early stage of the war that, um, you know, there was food, it was, it was, um, simple fare. I don't think there was a vast amount of it, but it, they weren't being maltreated. This was a time when the Japanese were very much focusing on the, the, the Sukjin, the, um, reign of terror against the civilian communities. The actual POWs at these stages, I would call it sort of malign neglect. I mean, the Japanese didn't do very much actively against them, but equally they were tardy in terms of um, medical treatment and um, food. But I think in terms of Doris and Peters, they were able to get much greater support than they had in the jungle, clearly. Um, and this is where she first comes to the attention of the commander of that military district under whom the, um, the prison came, this fellow called... Um, Colonel Koda. He was the military commander, and he took a particular interest in this single female detainee. He tried to persuade her, or he got his staff to try to persuade her to move to the nearby convent, where the um, Sisters of Mercy, the nuns, were able and willing to give her you know, treatment as a woman, um, give her her own room and look after her. She refused. She initially refused. Um, but was eventually persuaded to go, um, to go and have what she, I think she thought was just going to be a few weeks of re rehabilitation and uh, convalescence. But while she was away and being looked after by the nun, the Japanese vacated the prison. They sent all the prisoners away, mostly to Pudu and KL or down to Changi. Um, so while she was there, Peters and all her, um, so she got very close to some, um, some of the holy brothers, the, the Catholic brothers, and they were all taken away. And so she suddenly isolated on her own in Taiping, um, in the convent, um, but without any of the other British or Australian um, so that she got used to. So that must have been a tough moment for her when she realized she was very much on her own. Her husband had died. Everybody she knew had disappeared. She was in occupied Japan, in Taiping, 
and she must have felt very, very lonely. So, um, but she was and had come to the attention of um, Colonel Coda, um, the, uh, the military commander. And when you say she came to the attention of Coda, right? Um, yeah. As if uh, Coda had eyes on her or, or stuff like that. Well, I think we must assume that. The historic record, I have to say, we don't have anything from Coda and we don't have anything specific from Doris. But as a pattern of behavior, you have to say that um, he then arranged for her. He then moved down to become the commander of what's called the Western Garrison based in Kuala Lumpur. It was elevation. He was a... Um, as best we know about him, um, he was a rather flamboyant, um, risk-taking commander. And you can see this in his behavior with Doris as well. Famous reputation. So he was quite the man. And he was then sent down to the Western um, Garrison, command the Western Garrison out of Kuala Lumpur. And he then sent for her to be brought down in a staff car from Taiping to Kuala Lumpur, um, where he put her in a, a very nice bungalow. Um, in, um, but she, I suppose she, Andrew, she could not have refused. I mean, would that be? Would I you, think you're would right. Agree with that? I think you're right, Ranjit. She couldn't have refused. And of course, the choice was very, you know, she'd been through hell and beyond. She'd been starved. She was, she was, she was with the nuns, but she wasn't. A, and so suddenly you get this offer of luxury and somebody taking an interest in you. And she's in a very vulnerable, psychologically vulnerable moment. She gets taken to Kuala Lumpur and put in this wonderful old colonial house with servants, not too far from where her parents-in-law were living. And you can see why, you know, she could have her own bath. She wasn't with thousands of others of W's and everything. You can see the um, the attraction of all this. Um, anyway, when she comes to KL, again, very isolated, and there's no doubt that during this period, Koda, who started to visit, became her lover. Um, now, how much of that was coerced, how much of that developed as a sort of natural attraction between the two, um, you could ask the tea where he was certainly predatory, um, but, you know, it doesn't necessarily pertain that he was aggressive and, um, you know, it may have been a more subtle um, relationship. But there's no doubt that she was in a very vulnerable position and he exploited it. Just moving forward to to really the exciting part about the book. And this is where you have this, this character called Murakami coming in. And, yeah. and tell us about that. And tell us how, how that leads to Doris's death. And then what happens after that? Okay, well, we'll do it. I'll lead about, talk about Murakami, Doris's death, and then I'll go into the trial, if you will. Yeah. Okay, so um, let me go to a very powerful figure. Um, somebody in Kuala Lumpur that you wouldn't um, take on without some caution. But rumors began to get to the Kempitai. The Kempitai are the Japanese Gestapo, the military police, and they're there to impose discipline um, both on the local communities, that became notorious for their torturing, and their, um, and their repression, but they were also there to police the Japanese military and government machine. They had a wider role which was to keep that um, clean and um, non-corrupt and to um, keep it in order. And they had heard rumors that um, Colonel Coda was in fact skimming some budgets. He was acting in a corrupt way. He was taking money, for example, from some of the budgets that had been allocated for prisoner of war um, rations. So this rumor had reached the Kempatai and they then sent not somebody from the Kempatai office because they felt they may be too close and familiar with them, um, is uh, Colonel Coda, but they sent somebody from the Alaskar, a guy called Lieutenant Shuzi Murakami, who didn't know Coda and didn't know Kuala Lumpur. And he came down and he started making inquiries and he had heard some of these rumors about um, Coda and his behavior. But very early on, he also heard that Coda was, had a mistress whom he claimed to be Italian. Don't forget that at this stage of the war, the Italians were part of the Axis, Japan, yeah. Germany, Italy Japan. Com combination exactly. So, if you will, a um, uh, somebody uh, not 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 an enemy, not a, not a, not a, uh, somebody on your own side. Um, and she got used the name Dulcima. If you recall, that Dulcima was in fact Doris's birth name, a christening name, and, but it, it sounds Italian, Latinate. It has that sort of buzz. Um, 
Um, but I think everybody in Kuala Lumpur knew that she wasn't an Italian. I don't think she went out of the bungalow much. In fact, most people seem to actually know it was a bit of a secret, but not a very well kept one, that in fact she was the daughter in law of the Van der Straten family, who lived about a quarter of a mile away. And once Murakami heard this, he thought, well, here's a British Australian woman living with a commander. She must be a British spy. And it was, wasn't a stupid deduction. You know, it was, um, she certainly wasn't an Italian. She didn't speak any Italian. Um, and it was very quickly discovered when Murakami went around to visit her at the bungalow that she spoke no Italian. He challenged her and her story began to fall apart. She got very feisty, very angry with him. She was a feisty girl. Pushed back, you know, told him that she was going to, he was going to get into trouble from Coda. Um, she clearly felt she was protected. And he then took her to the, um, took her by car to the um, Kempatai headquarters, the Lee Rubber Building, right in the middle of Chinatown, in the middle of KL. And therein they uh, had and three sorry, Can days. I ask, sorry, can I, can I, sorry, just before you, you carry that, can I, can I just ask, I mean, we, we've, you've got a situation here where Coda is effectively the, or one of the most senior military officers for the Japanese army in, in KL. Um, his... Uh, mistress is carted away to Wisma, um, uh, Lee Rubber, which, you know, we all know. Um, didn't Koda try to sort of get her out and, or, you know, um, um, at least There's no Murakami. evidence of that, Gopal. I mean, maybe he did, but I, mm -hmm. I think at the same time he was under investigation and he probably knew that his position was pretty weak as well. I wouldn't be at all survived if he looked to himself. Um, there's no evidence that he actively engaged in supporting Norris. So um, I think we have to assume that he was under investigation and was indeed guilty and found separately to be um, guilty and uh, carted away. And we think sent back to Japan, stripped of his ranks. Um, but there was no sense. But of course, this is um, when Murakami comes to talk about his role about it later on in after the war. He said that I have to be very careful because, you know, here was, the, you know, I was investigating the commander. Would I wouldn't do anything stupid to this woman. I wouldn't abuse her in any sense because she was his mistress. So there is a sort of logic to his argument, Murakami's, that he had to proceed very carefully because if he got it wrong and um, he had missed, you know, made allegations that weren't the case, um, as sure as hell, um, Coda would have got his own back. Um, yeah. So sorry, we can pivot That's back now, back to 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 Wisma Lee. Sorry, to 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 Luke. Wisma Lee. So yeah. when Doris Andrew, enters. You, you, sorry, Andrew, you sort of let the cat out of the bag, right? Talk about Murakami after the war, yeah, right? But come back. So <laughs> what happens to Doris or Dosima and uh, Lee Rubber? Well, she is taken into the Lee Rubber building by Murakami. He has a couple of sort of hoods, basically, sort of heavies, so local, not not Japanese who support him in this effort. Um, she's taken in and it's essentially, I think, two nights, three days of interrogation. Up on the very top floor of the building, there are a series of small cells, interrogation rooms at the far the back end of the building, overlooking a small narrow road to the back. She's taken in and um, according to Murakami, um, she is interrogated in a perfectly acceptable way. She's offered a room to, to rest. She was given tea. Um, she was questioned, but not abused. I think we have to be very skeptical of that. The uh, Kemp yeah. Diver the notorious violent. Um, the other one that does seem to have happened, and the interrogation does seem to have um, escalated. I think to begin with, it probably was fairly simple, but probably quite hostile questioning. But it becomes more and more physical. No doubt. Certainly by day two, day three, um, she's and she's fighting back. She's very feisty. Accuses Murakami of being a tyrant. Tells him that she can't. He can't do things to her. And you don't say this to a Kempatai officer in an interrogation cell because um, you know this is not what they're used to. But she did. She fought back. And as the interrogation goes on and on, and her story unravels and becomes less and less. Um, plausible about being Gucci, the Italian. Um, he gets angrier and angrier, and her response just makes him angry. So, until the, finally the third day, um, there's a final interrogation session. Um, 
where she fights back. According to later testimony, he ends up stripping her, threatens to rape her, um, terrorizes her, um, and she plunges to her death from the fourth floor of the window of the interrogation cell. Um, now, the big question is, did she jump? As Murakami was to claim, and others would claim, and it was suicide. They claimed to protect her lover, Colonel, or was she pushed? Did Murakami, in a fit of anger and temper at being slapped, Doris choose to push her to her death in a moment of madness? Um, those are the two stories that are given out. And uh, I don't think the only two people that actually know uh, were Murakami and Doris. Um, if I could, here, Ranjit, I'll just leap on a bit because I think it's an interesting color. Yeah, I went with some friends. The Lee Brother building is being renovated as a sort of a luxury boutique hotel. And I went with about, about three years ago, two years ago, with a friend when it had been stripped back, it had been cleared as a building and it was back to its bones. Um, and I was able to enter on a Sunday morning and went for a little walk into this um, skeleton of a building and we went up to the top floor and we found what we were pretty clear markings on the ground of where these interrogation cells had been at the back of the building um, overlooking this small service road. And it was a very modern building at the time. It was probably the most modern, up-to-date um, office building in Kuala Lumpur. It was very much in the modern style. It had these big open windows, metal, swung out, and a very low window sill. And actually, it was very easy. And then when I went there, and I thought, my God, I'm looking at the same scene that Doris, Uchima, and Murakami were all those years ago. Um, hairs on the back of my neck went up. And it, what, one thing that struck me was even as a visitor looking down, it was a very low window sill and it did swing right open this window. It would have been very easy either to tumble to your death or to be pushed. It wouldn't, it, uh, it facilitated yeah. that. So both, both sides are plausible. Both sides are plausible. So which side, which side was the Victoria's side in this? Was she pushed? Right? Or did she fall to her death? Well, it's sort of easier because I actually don't have a strong view on that. I have one view is that it could have been, it could have been somewhere between the two. Um, a tussle, angry, threatening, forcing somebody as a form of torture, maybe naked, semi-naked. You know, you're terrorizing somebody. And one thing you can do is put their head over the window and threaten them with death. Um, equally, it would have been very easy for her. So it may be somewhere in the middle. It could be somewhere in the middle where something went wrong, an accident. She rushed to the window. We just don't know. It would have been a very intense moment of a seconds. It's not something you plan to do. It's not something that's um, pre preconceived. Yeah. And so it's that, a moment that of a bit about the trial. Yeah. The the trial, about the trial. Yeah, let's leap ahead to the trial. Um, when the British came back in... Um, in September 1945, very quickly, one of the things they came under pressure to do was to put on trial Japanese and collaborators who had been involved in war crime trial. And in Kuala Lumpur, when one of the very early trials to take place was indeed that of Shuzi Murakami. I think the British put it on early because they thought this was a done, a done deal. They had a claimingly, a claiming a eyewitness. This was a European woman who was pushed to her death. They'd actually managed to find, sometimes this is a problem, finding the, um, the perpetrator of this crime. There was no doubt they had Shuzi Murakami. He didn't deny he was the interrogator. So it really came down to a testimony, um, with Murakami giving his testimony. Obviously, Doris couldn't, but there were one or two other wide witnesses. And indeed, to be frank, there are conflicting stories, conflicting stories about the whole sequence, and indeed, the final moments. Murakami claimed he wasn't even in the building. He claimed he had gone back to Koda's house to look for some documents and some material. And it was only when he came back that he saw on the ground this body and the road under a blanket. Others claimed that, um, other white witnesses claimed that indeed they had seen Murakami interrogating her and had actually been an eyewitness to the murder. Um, that particular witness, though, his testimony was questioned because he himself was part of the Japanese interrogation team. And it was a 
claim by the Defence Council that he was tailoring his evidence to save his own skin. So we're actually left. Tell us about the Hamas story. Yeah. Sorry, Andrew. Um, just moving on. Mm. What about her husband? Well, uh, Philip had survived the war, as I mentioned before. He'd been in an internment camp in um, Bangkok throughout the war. He thought Doris had died. And when he got back to Kuala Lumpur, discovered that she hadn't died, at least at the Camp on Toh massacre, but then heard the story of her, her death, a tragic story. And I think Philip comes out of this story as one of the great heroes because just at a time when a lot of people were very conflicted as to how to view Doris, was she this femme fatale, the scarlet woman who had slept with the enemy and got the justice she deserved, what the French called uh, collaboration horizontale, you know, sleeping with the enemy. And many people felt that she deserved this for what she was doing. Philip, of all people, uh, husband, forgave her. He was utterly, and he, he came to the trial and he actually gave testimony, saying, gave the story of Camp and what had happened and why they both thought each other had died. So he said that she was, you know, she thought she was a widow. Um, and even so, he, she, he gave testimony that I think lent uh, a much more benign view towards Doris and her behaviour when others were trying to betray her in a much more um, malign malign manner. So the, the, I think one of the interesting things about the story, and the trial brings it out, is that there are no black and whites, that there are a series of um, events that, even if we knew the facts, we might interpret them differently depending on where we're standing from. And even then, the facts are not entirely pinned down. Um, but the, the one, one fact is that she plunged to her death at the end of three days of um, interrogation. And what was the verdict, uh, Andrew? The cliffhanger. Well, What's the verdict? Extraordinarily, extraordinarily, Anjit. Um, the judge went away. It was very brisk justice, but it was an adversarial system. And the British judge, fellow called Lieutenant Colonel Cully, on the final day comes down and he acquitted Modakami. He, um, he found favour with the argument that the um, prosecution witnesses had collaborated, had um, coordinated their position, that they themselves were trying to defend themselves because they were exposed because of their behaviour in the Kempatai headquarters. And he felt there was sufficient or insufficient weight of evidence um, to prosecute and convict Murakami. Now, my, I'm not only you guys, are, you guys are the legal eagles. My view is that you might just about argue that as first degree murder. Maybe there wasn't sufficient evidence, um, with beyond reasonable doubt. Um, but surely there should have been a second charge. Andrew, do you know what happened to him, Murakami? Well, he went Murakami back to Japan, we think. He went down the last scene in one, they had these vast holding pens in Rio, actually, um, off Singapore, where they, built these vast camps for the Japanese. And it took them two or three years, actually, to get the Japanese um, soldiers all back to Japan. It was such a big business, and there weren't many ships. Um, but eventually, he ended up in Japan. Um, he left Malaya in, um, I think it was later that year, or 1947, um, and was sent back to, um, to, to Japan. And what happened to Philip? I mean, the... the the, the husband, the ultimate yeah. loser. He yeah. was a good guy. In that sense, he, good guy, uh, loser, lived, hero. He lived with his good sister guy. in KL, Mina. He lived with sister and their daughter, Paget. And then on independence, Mina decided to go back to Britain. She didn't really know Britain, but she wanted to be working with the British Army. So she went back to Southampton in, um, in the south of England. And Philip went back, and he acted as a security guard at Southampton Docks, it's called. And he died of a heart attack in 1965. Um, Did so, he ever marry again? No, no, no. Do you know whether he married again? No, no, he didn't. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't. So um, a tragic figure, but he comes out of it as one of the uh, the gentle heroes of this rather sad story. Um, I suppose we're about to end the podcast, but on an end note which has nothing to do with Doris, I, I would like to ask you one question, and which is a quote from one of your books, right? You quoted someone, I can't remember whom, and this is what was said. When the British abandoned Penang, 
right? The quote was, the moral collapse of British rule in Southeast Asia came not in Singapore, but at Penang, right? Now, mm -hmm. you've written a lot about the war at Penang. You've written about the fact that on a certain night, I can't remember what night it was, the Europeans just deserted Penang and left Penang, right, completely uh, open for the Japanese to walk in, mm -hmm. right? How much... How much do you agree or disagree with the statement that the moral collapse of British rule came in Penang? Well, I, I agree with it. Um, it comes from uh, two very significant Cambridge academics who wrote a book about it, Harper, and a fellow's name, Professor Harper. Um, I think the key thing about Penang and the withdrawal from Penang by the British was, as you mentioned, the fact that when the British allowed the last boats to leave Penang, here, it was a white-only, European-only decision. And some very senior figures, I mean, hugely big families, huge players in the community, who would always, and these were the loyalists, these were the people, this is, don't forget, straight settlements, the king's Chinese, the king's whatever. Um, these are people who the British had promised were citizens, citizens of the empire. You have a passport, you can travel under a British passport. Yet when it really came to it, when it came to a limited number of places on a limited number of boats, the British Navy sailors would only allow on Europeans, the white, people of white the Europeans. And uh, so I think it was even, even that, the, really, that showed, exposed the, um, the reality of the British Empire. And it was not only women and children. It, even the men got off the, on the boats and, and sort of ran, right? Isn't, isn't that the fact? Well, I think... Prior to that, many of the women and children had already been, the Europeans had already been evacuated by train and they went down to Singapore. So actually at the end, there weren't that many European women and children left, but there were a few. It was mostly the last, a handful of British men stayed behind bravely to continue to help um, doctors, salvation, that sort of thing. Um, but at the end, it was mostly the remnants of the British military command, the administration there and so forth. Um, there weren't that many, it may have been a handful or so, but most of the women and children had already evacuated um, in the previous weeks. In fact, that is subject of another story that, that one day we will hope to go through. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much. Thanks for asking.